Hi, Paul. How are you? Jack, I am fine. And thank you so much for inviting me to join you and the people who are following your work. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's a great honor to me. Could you please introduce yourself, especially in the context of your investment career? I know that you're very well known in the industry. You're a legend, actually. But if you could just, for those who are really new to the markets, if you could just tell a few words about yourself, who you are, and about your investment career. Well, it, it is interesting that you comment that, that I'm a legend because the reality is, is I'm a teacher. And I have spent my whole career since the 60s, 1960s, basically teaching people what I was learning about investing. And I, I will tell you, Jack, that what I teach today is very different from what I taught in the 60s. But, uh, but I was around the industry in the 60s as a stockbroker. And it didn't take very long for me to figure out that there were some huge conflicts of interest. And so I left the industry and went out and did a number of other things uh, from about the age of uh, 23, 24 until I was, uh, I guess, about 40. And then uh, I basically, I mean, we talk about the fire movement and how people want to retire early. I didn't think of it that way, but I actually had accumulated enough at that point that I could at least theoretically retire. Uh, and so I retired and I started all over and I built a, a business offering not only teaching and teaching people how to do everything on their own, but if you didn't want to do it after you learned what you should do, I was happy to do it for you. And, uh, and I really have to laugh because when we sold, when I sold my ownership in my company in 2012, I think we had 1.5 billion plus uh, under management. But when we started in 1983, we had nothing under management. And I had no idea I was going to build an investment advisory firm. So my minimum investment that I would help somebody, I, you had to have at least $2,000. And I charged you 1%, which meant that I was willing to work for you for a year for $20. So <laughs> it was not a business model uh, built to, uh, to, to, to make anybody any money. But over time, people came to work with me. And as they did, we had to run up more like a business. But we never, ever gave up on the dedication to teaching people how to do it on their own. And then when I retired in 2012, uh, I was unemployed uh, for a few moments, maybe hours, <laughs> and I had started this foundation, uh, Merriman Financial Education Foundation, where we again teach people how to do this all on your own. But there are two things that are different. Number one is I don't make a penny. That's part of the deal. Uh, I'm not allowed to make any money here. Uh, and we're not teaching so that people can become a client. We're teaching so people really either are going to be a better client for somebody else or really learn how to be a, a do-it-yourself investor. Thank you, Paul, for all the work you're doing for us for so many years. I really appreciate it. And by the way, on your website, there's so many articles and so many materials. I, I just don't know how you do it and how many hours you sleep per day, but it's just wonderful. But I'd like to use your great experience, uh, which you gained over the years, because you basically have like over 50 years of investment experience, or so you were on the markets also like for more than 50 years. Do you think, and by the way, I have so many questions today, so I apologize in advance. Do you think that the markets as such changed during that time? Is there maybe on the other side and anything that doesn't change? How do you see that? Well, the market has changed uh, a ton. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is, is that today, uh, investing is so much more efficient than it was when I started in the mid '60s, and uh, and and, it, and it's built, so it's in the favor of the investor 
that is a change because in the in the 60s you had an eight and a half percent load on almost every mutual fund including bond funds if you can believe it in fact when money market funds first came out they tried to put a commission on those money market funds but of course the 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 public said no way we go to the banks and they don't charge us a commission to put our money away why should we pay you and they quickly adjusted that's one thing about wall street if something's not working they quickly adjust <laughs> uh and 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 so today we have the index funds we didn't have those uh, when i started uh today we have commissionless trades we have trades that that the only real cost is a spread and today the spread is not regulated uh, as it was back in the 60s and commissions are not regulated like they were in the 60s then by the way early in the 70s as well so it is a whole new world for investors the problem is that the emotions i think of investors today are very similar to the emotions and those challenges when I came into the industry over 50 years ago. Okay, so we'll get back to these um, um, uh, challenges, emotional challenges, because this is a big topic. But um, then I assume that obviously when you started in the 60s, you couldn't start as a passive investor because there was no such idea broadly known at that time yet. So you had to start as an active investor for sure. And then how your career was evolving, how you were evolving as, a, as an investor, how your philosophy, how your approach to the market was evolving over the time. Well, I want to go back to the early thing you said there about uh, active management versus passive. There were a lot of passive investors. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, today we would probably see them as do-it-yourself investors because what they believe was you take the time to find 10 or 15 or 20 stocks and you invest in those stocks. You take the actual physical certificate, you put it in a lockbox. And the idea was you leave it there until you retire and then you start taking out shares and, 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 and liquidating them to pay for your retirement. And I have friends that are still doing that. They've been doing it all their life, and it is as close to a buy and hold uh, as an investor that I, I know because it is even less volatile than what an index fund would do. And, <laughs> and so, yes, it did, but Wall Street didn't want that. Wall Street wanted activity, and that's where they make their money. So, so it is a, a tug of war. Uh, for Wall Street, because they want my friends to sell out and go go do something with that money and, and give us a chance to make a commission or something. But my career, after I left the brokerage business, I was in it less than three years as a, as a salesperson. Uh, and I did, I did not uh, do anything in terms of, of, of investing for the public, except that I did some some uh, venture capital work and help some small companies uh, get started. Uh, and then uh, eventually, and, and by the way, one of the things that happened to me, I, I, I love the randomness of, of life, Jack. When I was going to school in New York, and I went to a school while I was working for Harris Upham, which eventually becomes part of Smith Barney. Uh, so I was working for a New York firm, but while I was there going to the New York Institute of Finance, which is a fancy name for a, a sales training program, um, I met a fellow, his name was Sam, and Sam was a fellow who was in his mid-60s. I was a 22-year-old kid, and he was in his 60s. He had been a believer in market timing with point-and-figure strategies for decades, and he had retired from running a drug company in the Chicago area to become a stockbroker at age 65. So he was in New York uh, and a married guy. I was in New York and a married guy. Sam sat down and taught me point and figure. So I had my first serious introduction to what we would call market timing uh, early on. 
And I was always attracted to that because my nature is to be defensive. I, I look at everything that we do in, in, in educating people to be better as an investor, as a defensive step, whether it's lowering expenses or lowering turnover or lowering taxes or lowering investment management fees. Every one of those steps is one of defense to keep more money, hopefully, we never know, but hopefully in your pocket. And market timing, I did not see it as a way to make more money, I saw it as a way to protect against losing money. And if you look at that period from the mid 60s through about, I don't know, 1982 or 83, people who invested in the market, many of them didn't make any money because they got caught by one market decline after another. And you had all the people who sold out at the bottom of, of those declines and there were tons of people that had not been successful. And yet those people who really bought and held, they did okay if they bought and held the right asset classes. So there were lessons there. And then there were lessons about market timing. So I come into the money management business in 1983, just after We've been through this very long period where people didn't use defensive strategies. And if they had used defensive strategies, they would have done okay. They wouldn't have gotten rich, but they would have made reasonable rates of return. And then I started business. And at that point, what I was doing was market timing. I was, I was telling people, when when to move. In fact, we had a service. You, you would like this, Jack. We would call you. You would pay us an annual fee, and we would call you and say, we're a movie, <laughs> and here's what mm -hmm. we're doing. And, and people would do that. And many of those people found out they couldn't do it, and so they hired us to do it for them. And then about 10 years later, we had a lot of clients that we were doing that for who had other money that was more traditional buy and hold kind of money. And they were asking us for help with that as well. And so we added that to our practice. So we showed people how to market time. We showed people how to buy and hold. In fact, I used to do a six hour workshop, three hours on buy and hold in the morning, three hours in the afternoon on market timing. And people would walk out of there and say, what does he believe in? <laughs> it was confusing to people. And in fact, I, I, be, I believed in both. But as I spent more time in the trenches with clients and with students, I realized there is a huge difference between the ability to make buy and hold work for a lifetime and to make timing work for a lifetime. And that's fascinating what you are talking about uh, in uh, in the respect of uh, active and passive investment. And I will go back deeper into that in a, in a while. But quite often you are saying in your podcast also that you are a big fan of using academic scientific knowledge. And you mentioned that, for example, Wall Street was not that uh, interested about passive invest investing because obviously the commissions are lower paid to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, But someone may ask, on the other hand, why not use the knowledge of Wall Street because they are practitioners in the end? So why you are such a big fan of academic scientific approach? Quite often you, for example, refer to uh, Professor Fama, Professor French, uh, 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 papers or in, in your podcast? Well, I, I, I guess the, the, what we have to ask ourselves is what does the evidence show? What is the evidence that says that Wall Street works uh, on our behalf? First and foremost, like a fiduciary, somebody who always does what's in your best interest. That isn't true. And there are all sorts of ways that I can make that judgment about Wall Street. I've, I've got a free book at my website entitled Get Smart or Get Screwed, How to Select the Best and Get the Most Out of Your Financial Advisor. And in that book, I have 80 reasons why I don't trust commission-based salespeople. I don't mean they're not nice people. I don't mean they don't make good dads and, and friends and whatever that, but... 
they come with a conflict of interest that I think as we as we think about what are the challenges of individual investors with the investing process, you might also ask, does a broker have some of the very same challenges because it even mixes in then their compensation, not only making decisions of what to buy and sell, but then how they make a living. And I just intuitively see enough fines being paid. I mean, always these big brokerage firms will not admit guilt, of course, but they're paying these multi-million, sometimes multi-billion dollar fines. Where do they get the money to pay those fines? Out of our pockets. So just intuitively, I don't want to count on them to take care of my money for the rest of my life, nor do I want that to be the decision-making process for others. But what I do trust about the academic community is a couple levels of trust that are built in. One is their job is to do real research that is in the best interest of, at, in a sense, of the investor at the end of the day. And then when they do that research and they bring it to their peers, they are then open to criticism from their peers. And the peers love to pick them apart if they can, because there's a kind of competition going on there. Because the people who have come up with the best research, if you want to look at it that way. Those are the people who have become the most famous and maybe even found a way to cash in on it. But the bottom line is intuitively that process of what they go through to determine what's in your best interest. I think that's more trustworthy. And, and, and by the way, they will readily admit they can't tell you the future. Fama and French can't tell you the future. They could tell you what the premium for small cap value has been in the past, but they can't tell you what the premium will be in the future. But i tell you what they will tell you is they believe wholeheartedly there will be a premium for small and a premium for value. It isn't magic, just like there should be a premium for equities over fixed income. But not always for very long periods of time, whether you're looking at bonds versus stocks or large versus small, and they help us understand that. They don't hide the bad news. They they reveal the bad news because that bad news is what an investor is going to have to go through to get from point A to the end of their life. And we need to prepare them. The academic community, I think, does the best job of preparing them for the reality of successful investing. Investing is an important aspect of our lives, that's for sure. But what else, uh, in, in, in your opinion, should we do to feel satisfied and have a happy life? Because, for example, when I look at you, it's so amazing that you are so active and you are having such a big passion in educating people. And really, I just enjoy talking to you. Is this maybe a recipe for a happy life, just being active and having a mission? And uh, I was reading, and by the way, I will return to that later on, uh, to your um, discussion to Jack Bogle you had mm. a few years ago. And after that, when you were commenting that, uh, that uh, meeting, you wrote on your, uh, on, on your blog that, and I just will uh, quote it, I have always thought I would continue my work until I'm 85. But seeing Bogle and how much he obviously loves what he is doing, I'm now committing to continuing until at least age 90. So is it just a recipe for a happy life, just being so much, you know, dedicated and have a, such a big passion and just educate people and do what you love? Well, you know something, I, uh, to be fair, I am, I'm retired. And as a retiree, I have lots of other friends who are retired. Uh, and I get together with them often. And some of those people look at their success in retirement as being built on three legs. Leg number one is family. Leg number two is friends. Leg number three is golf. Okay? All right. Now, now <laughs> other people uh, have, I find, those same two first legs 
But that third leg is something else. And I don't know if the reason I spend all the time I do on a, a financial education is because I love it or because I can't play golf. But I will tell you that there is a great feeling when you're doing something to help others. My mother was a nurse and, and, and she spent her career helping others. She used to go in on weekends uh, with her doctor and they would let kind of They'd let people, this goes back before Medicare, they'd let people in the back door to come in and get their, get their, uh, their, their help with their health at, at, at no cost. She just had a commitment to helping others that, that it, it was a great lesson for me. And she also, by the way, never failed to remind me, be nice to everybody you meet in your life. And she said, you never know how they're going to change your life. And by the way, that that has absolutely been true. But the passion for teaching, it's what I know, Jack. I don't know anything else as much as I do this. And the reality is, you said it earlier, money is a part of everybody's life. Exactly. And the fact is, if people can get that right, they are going to solve one of the major problems in marriages, and that is problems around money decisions. And they're going to be able to retire with dignity. And they're going to be able to leave more to others. And I don't mean they have to, to, to have a, a, a job that pays them a million dollars a year so they can invest 100000 I mean, just the people who can find ways to put away five, six, seven thousand dollars a year eventually as they grow their income. People, everybody can do this as long as they don't do too many things wrong. And I don't want them to make the mistakes that most all of us have made. I don't know what your mistakes have been, Jack, but I can tell you I did a whole bunch of things early on that I wish I could take back. And I'm trying to help young people. I have this weekend, I have a high school group on the East Coast that I'm going to be doing on Saturday and teaching them. And then next week, I'm doing a university group of kids. And uh, I want to help them. And we have ways to help them. But then we also want to help the people who are retired because they, too, can take steps to take better care of their money. I wanted to talk now about the behavioral challenges and aspects of investing, because this is what we, you know, everyone will face it once we invest any money. So how do you, for example, control your emotions when it comes to investing? Or what would you recommend also to others in terms of managing our emotions? Because this is a big yeah. part of the whole process. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one for me. I made a brilliant decision years ago. I mean, I cannot tell you how happy I am that I made this decision. I made the decision that as I looked at my own personal response to the market and to my investments, that I was probably smarter to have somebody else do it rather than do it myself. I am happy to teach all day others to do it on their own. But I know myself, and because I, I am defensive, my mind is defensive at all times, when the start market starts going down, if, if I don't have somebody there taking care of it, I probably would overreact like so many people do. So yeah, there's a price to have somebody take care of it, and it's a price, by the way, that over a lifetime can be worth millions and millions of dollars. I mean, there is a payoff for learning how to do this yourself that is just huge. On the other hand, if we make those, those bad decisions, panic when the market is down, not want to re invest when the market is down, forget about panicking and getting out. Just, some people just stop investing when the market is down. The very time that they could be buying more shares in, in terms of the price they pay, that will, from everything we know about the past, you'll get a reward for that later. And the cheaper the shares you buy in the first place, the bigger the reward later. But it's a 
difficult hurdle to get over for a lot of people. I don't know if you look at the numbers, Jack, but at, at least in the U.S., something like 25%, and I've even seen numbers up to as much as 40% of millennials will not put any money in the stock market. They do not want to take the risk. They look at investing as just one big crapshoot. It's a gamble or it's just a, a, a massive speculation. And then they can just be crazy and conclude, by the way, the same people can be crazy and conclude that cryptocurrency is a safer place to put their money than the S&P 500. I mean, these kinds of, of, of interesting thoughts that people have, I don't want to call, I shouldn't call them crazy, but, but people come to conclusions about investing that just there is no evidence that they are right but it's what their heart or their gut or their brain is telling them. And by the way, the academic community has, has, has figured this all out and they have a whole list of biases uh, that, that people yeah. have that stand in the way of their investment success. And at the end of the day, if we can figure out how to manage each one of those biases, which is what I'm trying to help people do, they are likely to be successful. But if they don't know those biases, how will they identify whether they might that might be the reason they don't achieve what they want to achieve? Self-awareness in this business is absolutely huge. And so I know me, but I'm 78, so I've had time to know me. And young people don't have much time, much time behind them to know themselves and to understand the investment process. But the sooner they get it, the more likely they are. And I'm talking about the market as well as themselves, the sooner they are to be a success. So how do you think uh, an investor should adjust strategy so that it it's really matching his or her, um, let's say, psychological construction? Because I think it's a big part of the whole uh, process because people quite often the, the the beginners they have uh, funny expectations about what they can have on the market, and these uh, expectations may be leading to the wrong decisions. So how for a novel investor to have realistic expectations? How to approach that problem? Well, it, it, let me talk about the seven things that we do on our website because they are aimed at helping people get through those decisions and understand them. We do not give tax advice. We do not talk about Roth IRAs and 401ks in terms of all the legal aspects of it. We are not financial planners. We are not estate planners. We have focused in on the area of, of understanding and learning what equity asset classes you should have in your portfolio because for 99.9% .9 of folks out there that is the gas that is what's going to give them the growth to have the money that they're going to want later on the second thing is once you understand what those equity asset classes are and not individual securities i have no idea how to do that but rather broad big companies, small companies, growth companies, value companies. There are ways the academics have broken these out that it's really easy to understand the past. Then we want to know how much of each one of those should you have. Then we want to know how much should you have in fixed income to go along with the gas, the bonds. That's the break. The bonds are not trying to make you rich. And as a matter of fact, they're keeping you from making yourself rich if you don't have, if, if you have all in bonds and no stocks. So what's that balance of equities and fixed income as an investor? We have built tables. They're called the fine tuning your asset allocation tables. They show all S&P 500 100% in S&P 500 from 1970 to 2020. At the other side of the table, on the left-hand side, is all bonds, breaks at all times. In between 
in 10% increments, we show a combination of more bonds and less stocks so that you can, you can look at 10% in equities, 90% in bonds, 20% in equities, 30, 40, you've got the idea. And at the bottom of that page, you will learn, okay, had you done that with the S&P 500 since 1970, here's how much you would have made with each one of those combinations. But then below there is the other part of the formula. Not only how much you make, but how much did you have to lose? I have stood in front of thousands and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, and I have said, I don't mean in one room, by the way. I have <laughs> said, if you follow my advice, I guarantee you will lose money. Absolutely guarantee it. And then the people will laugh nervously. What do you mean you guarantee I'll lose money? <laughs> and I said, well, because part of the process of investing and taking the risk of bonds or stocks, sometimes you lose. With bonds, it's teeny tiny amounts of losses. With stocks, it's huge. It can be if you look back far enough, it can be 80 or 90 percent of the value of the securities. As a matter of fact, if you have all your money in General Motors and it goes broke or, or in Washington Mutual or in Eastern Airlines or a whole bunch of other companies, you lose everything, which is why we don't want you in individual <laughs> companies. But that table helps you understand what you're going to have to go through. So I could ask somebody. How much are you willing to lose? And they say, well, I'm willing to lose 20%. And I'll say, okay, it looks to me like you should be maybe 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds because you're likely to lose that much. And in fact, if you do that, I can almost guarantee you lose that much. And they'll say, you know, guaranteed? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to lose that much. That's the tug of war people need to go through. But they also need to find out what amount of exposure to risk do they need to reach where they want to go? Well, that's going to depend on how much they put away. And, 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 and all those kinds of moving parts, we do our best to show people historical information, in some cases going all the way back to 1928, so that they will see that, that either how much you make, how much you lose, how long you don't do what you expected. You talked about expectations, Jack. People's expectations are if you go into stocks, you're going to make a lot of money real fast. Yes. And sometimes it can take you 20 years to break even. I mean, that's that's the two sides of that stock portfolio uh, a commitment. And so I'm trying to educate people to have the reality. And in some cases, it causes people to be less aggressive than they might have otherwise. And what I don't know is if I've just hurt them or I've helped them. Because maybe if they had taken that greater, more risky path, they would have stayed the course. They wouldn't have cashed in like so many people do. Or maybe it will be the reason they don't cash in because they figured that out and they accepted that risk on day one. I'm going to be dead and buried before these people find out if what I recommended was really the best thing for them. But I'm trying, and that's all we can do. And that's that's the same path you're on in your work. And do you think that an average person can run their own investment or should rather find someone, delegate that to services like, for example, robo-advisory or someone like even you, as you said, uh, you are an expert in investing, but you prefer to have someone who pulls the strings. I mean, so it's following the strategy you set, but do you think that an average person also should try to uh, follow that path? Well, I want to make one thing very clear in my portfolio where somebody's taking care of it. It's very complex. It is half in buy and hold with 10 different asset classes in equity and then the right amount of fixed income and rebalancing and taking money out uh, to pay for our retirement because I don't have a pension. This this is the money that, that, that we live on. And then the other half is using an active strategy called market timing. And again, that's something that, that I would never be able or willing to keep up on a regular basis. So I want to be careful that 
that I, mine is very complex, but it's what I want. On the other hand, there are very simple strategies that you can do on your own. In, in, in the book that we recently wrote last December, published uh, called We're Talking Millions, 12 Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement, we talk about a bunch of, of important decisions that you make. But number 12, a million dollar decision all on its own is to use what they call a target date fund. Now, when you buy a target date fund, what happens is you, in essence, have a robo advisor. You have a robo advisor who knows that you want to retire in 2065. That's great because that robo advisor, they understand the kind of risk you should be taking. Now, they're probably going to be a little more conservative than I would like but certainly they would be right on spot with what a John Bogle would like. And so they would have mostly in stocks. And then as they get older and older and older, at some point they add more bonds and more bonds and more bonds so that when you get to retirement in 2065, according to these professionals, and they manage trillions of dollars, I mean, it's not like these are are, are people just getting started in the business? They know what they're doing. Now, by the way, they don't know the future either. So they know what they're doing to do what they think is the basic right thing for you. And I want to differentiate at some point here, if we get a chance to, Jack, between what John Bogle wants for people and what I want for people, because it's different. But those target date funds allow you to let somebody else do it. And you know what you have to pay? About one-tenth of 1% 1 a year to as much as 15 one-hundredths of 1% 1 a year. When I was uh, getting started out and you had to buy a load fund and 8.5% was, was, was lost immediately, and then the, in, the, the, the expense ratios were about 1%. So for the rest of one's life, They'd be taking out 1% every year out of your hide. And you started with 8.5% less than you should have in the beginning. Today, you buy the target date fund. They do the right things, right, in quotes, because any two advisors could easily argue what's the right thing. But yes, you can do it on your own. And what I, uh, in our in our book about about the, 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 those 12 ways, one of the things we talk about is taking that target date fund, adding a little smidgen, a percentage, put 9% of your money in the target date fund, put 1% of your money in a, another fund, a small cap value fund, and it could increase over your lifetime anywhere from 25 to 100%. Uh, what you will have to spend and what you'll have to leave to others. So, and, and, and that would mean you'd have to do one thing every year. You'd have to divide your money. You put part 9% nine, 9 in one and 1% 1 in the other. So now you're investing in two funds instead of one. I think you could do that. Yes. So let's talk a bit about active versus passive approach because I see some people um, are, like I would say, dogmatic. They are telling, for example, that only passive approach is the only way we should go. And personally, I appreciate the idea of buy and hold and being passive, but is it really a big scene to use market timing strategy? I know you are doing that, so obviously this is not a big scene because you are an expert, but do you think that in general uh, market timing is working and you would recommend that for even an average investor or you think that the passive approach is better? Well, first of all, I, I wanted to, to take a stand here so that people understand market timing is something almost everybody in the industry does. When somebody says, you know, I think you should be getting out of those long-term bonds and moving into a short-term bond because interest rates are going to go up and the long-term bonds are going to go down, 
market timing. I think yeah. you should probably, you know, the, the small cap value has been doing well lately. Maybe it's time to move some money out of that large cap blend fund and put part of it over here in the small cap value market timing. People say, look, look, take some money off the table because you're going to have a chance to buy some of these stocks cheaper. Market timing. Every one of those pieces of recommendation, those are all market timing of decisions. Now, the fact that one like, like myself would say, well, my kind of market timing is that I watch the trend. And by the way, I, somebody's doing it for me, but they are watching the trend. And when the trend changes sufficiently to call it a chance, to, to opportunity to protect against further loss, you move out of the fund and you move to a money market fund, waiting to get back in later when the trend changes to the upside. Now, when you tell the market timing story, it's very easy to say, well, yeah, that makes sense. Why not? If you can do that, why not do it? Well, Here's the reason so many people struggle with it. I'm going to tell you that professionals struggle with it too, because it's not unusual for, for professionals to second guess their own systems. The system will give a buyer and a sell, and, and you, whether you're an amateur or you're a professional, you think, yeah, I can see it saying I should be getting out, but did you see that? That, that release of unemployment yesterday, it was fantastic. And there's all that money about to go into the, into the economy. No, 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 I don't. I want to override that for right now. I can always take care of it later if, if things get any worse. The minute you are second guessing a system, you are no longer an, a, 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 an automated uh, uh, auto uh, system based market timer. You are just like everybody else guessing what's going to happen next. And in the process of using these mechanical systems, boy, you know this as well as I do, Jack, you're going to have many times you'll have losses, multiple losses in a row with a system. You will sometimes get out of, a, of an investment at a price lower than you got in. Whoa, I don't like that. And then you'll get back in at a price higher than you got out. Whoa, doesn't that mean I have fewer shares than I had? Yes. And there'll be times that you have a major market decline and that system, while it may protect you from, from, from part of that decline, you still end up with a loss. And you somehow thought that magically somebody had a system that you would never have a loss in a bear market. You know, the expectations are just as wacky for people who look at market timing and come to judgments as to what it will be like as buy and holders. The difference is this. The buy and holder never has to do anything. And there's a chance that that will work but with market timing, every day you get up and theoretically, even when you're using systems that don't trade very often, you at least have the responsibility to consider what does the system say to do and then to do it. So okay. I, I'm, I'm just saying, Jack, that my concern is most people won't be able to do that. And, and I really respect the kind of work that you're doing and, and trying to help give people the data that they need and the ability to test systems. But they have to have the ability uh, to actually do what the systems say to do one day at a time. Thank you, Paul. I'm personally a quant, and uh, to me, market timing means following a mechanical strategy. Because yes. um, to me, discretionary approach wouldn't work because I'm too emotional. I, I, I would just do stupid things. So even sticking to the strategy is not a simple thing, but this is the only way for me. And by the way, do you think that once we are talking about this, uh, do you believe that there are good discretionary investors, market timers, who are taking decisions just based on their discretion, based maybe on their um, experience rather than on some rule-based system? Well, uh, first of all, 
I, I will tell you that uh, uh, people who do it professionally are, are, have some of the same problems. I think I mentioned this earlier. Uh, they second guess. If a system uh, stops working as expected and has several losing trades in a row, people get nervous. And in the process of getting nervous, they think, well, maybe I should find a better system. <laughs> Let me guarantee you, and you know this oh so well, that if a system hasn't been operating well lately, that you can go in and find a system that handled that market better than the one that you actually used. And while this seems uh, kind of a questionable thing to do, it is exactly what money managers do who pick active managers to manage for pensions. What they do is, if somebody doesn't perform well over three years, they say, well, uh, my, we got to do something about that. And <laughs> I've done an analysis, and here's a firm that did better, and I want you to get out of the bad firm and get into the good firm. What they don't tell you is studies show that when you get out of the bad firm and get into the good firm, you don't do one any better on average. And so it's just a way of looking busy and, 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 and acting as, as, as if you are earning your money. But they know better in almost every case. Here is one of the things that I did that was a major change in the money market, in the market timing business. Back in the 80s, uh, early on, I started using other market timers. I hired uh, other timers to, to use their systems. And the idea was that I would use uh, many systems rather than one. Now, I wouldn't do a majority rules, and if three out of the four are in, then that's the time to be in. And then when one of those sell, you get out, I divided the money into 25% increments and had four separate market timing systems, all systems that had worked in the past. This is not so different from having large cap and small cap and value and growth. It's the same kind of diversification. And as we did that, we then were, to the best of my knowledge, the first market timing organization to not only have multiple market timers, but to bring in international and small cap and large cap. So we were market timing a broadly diversified portfolio. By the way, my old firm still does that. And they and they do it for me, I'm happy to say. But the but the bottom line is, is that you with market timing can use multiple systems. But my recommendation is to let them each stand on their own because they're based on a different set of, of historical kinds of outcomes that somebody believes that those system trigger buy and sell signals are going to help you. And, and, and that is something that we did that I think a lot of people copied after we did that. But, but it, it, it makes sense to me, particularly when I look at my buy and hold portfolio, does the same thing, has small cap value and large cap value, but not market time. And by the way, you mentioned uh, in one of our emails exchange that uh, one of the strategy, uh, market timing strategy, has a great uh, track record. I'm not sure if I remember correctly, around 14% or something for the yeah. last uh, three decades, around three decades. Uh, what type of strategy it is? Is it a trend following or if you can tell us a bit about that strategy? Oh, you sure. Oh, no, I think it's... Uh... Uh, I, I was uh, there to start it in 1995, and, uh, uh, and then a, a person joined our firm, an, an, an engineer, in, in 1999 or 2000. But he took that, uh, uh, that hedge fund uh, over and has just had a, a wonderful track record. And here's what it does. I don't believe that market timing is going to get you a better rate of return. I believe that market timing, in fact, I believe that it's guaranteed that if you spend part of your time in a money market fund and part of your time in the market, that you're going to have lower volatility than if you're always in the market. That part yeah. is guaranteed. 
What isn't guaranteed is what the return will be by doing that. And in many cases, the return is lower. And in some cases, the return is higher. I got a lot of TV time. In fact, I was on a show you maybe never saw, Jack. It's called uh, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And I was a special guest one week. And it was because all of our money was out of the market during the crash of 1987. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is I did not call the crash. They wanted people to believe I called the crash. But the market timing systems I was tracking all were out of the market about a month before the crash happened. I didn't call the crash. The crash happened while we were out of the market. But it got me in front of a whole lot of people who wanted to know more about market timing. I hope that good luck happens to you someday. It does make a difference. But um, gosh, I got to thinking about that. And go back to your question one more time. Do you remember what you asked me, Jack, when I went off on the Wall Street week? Um, so basically, regarding that strategy with a great uh, track record, is it a trend following? Oh, yes, because I believe correct. that you sorry. you are a trend follower, or you have you liked, I think, that type of strategies, at least from what I uh, read on your uh, blog yeah. posts or on your podcasts. I'm sorry. Yes, what I was about to say is my sales pitch for timing was was not about making more money. It was about taking less risk and hopefully getting a decent return for exposure to equity uh, uh, holdings. What the the Leverage Global Opportunity Fund does, it combines market timing, defensive, with leverage. Okay. And so, uh, and there was good evidence, by the way, because in 1987, we were being tracked by a fellow named Mark Holbert, the Holbert Financial Digest. And we had accounts or, or strategies that they were tracking that were up over 50% in 1987. And that's because there was leverage in those accounts. And then we got out and then the market collapsed. So we looked like geniuses. <laughs> Nobody is ever a genius. You know, the market makes you money. You don't make money. The market does. And we were had the good fortune, like a lot of money managers do from time to time in their life, that makes them look better than they really are. But here's what I do know. When you combine market timing, traditional trend following, and sector rotation for a part of the portfolio, momentum kinds of work. Um, and we have many different strategies. It, it Sometimes we'll have a, 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 a hundred funds in the portfolio. And we don't use a lot of leverage, but enough leverage that it does make a difference. And it's just had a wonderful track record. A lot of people don't know this, but most hedge funds don't live past 10 years. Most of them are out of business within 10 years. So have to have been around since 1995 is, is a pretty doggone good track record. And by the way, the, the money made, the downside risk, you'll appreciate this, the downside volatility is about the same as the S&P 500. But the return over time is about, I'm talking about compounding, is over twice the S&P 500 since 1995. That's impressive. That's impressive. So, so now um, I hear about bogleheads and I also quite often hear about Merriman heads now. Uh, I wanted to, um, if you could tell us a bit more about your conversation with Jack Bogle you had uh, years uh, ago. How is Jack Bogle's philosophy different from yours, if if at all? Maybe it's about diversification. Um, how do you see that? And if you could just tell us a bit about that conversation you had with uh, Jack Bogle. Well, when you ask me this question, I, I'm telling the truth. I get goosebumps because <laughs> because it it was literally I mean, it was a really special. Uh, time. I, I was a program. I had an appointment for an hour in his office. And uh, 
And so I got there and he gave me 90 minutes. Uh, he was, uh, by some, I've heard that he can be gruff, particularly if he thinks that you're not straight or there's something about you not to be trusted. But he was really nice to me. He, th There is one huge difference between John Bogle and Paul Merriman. But let me tell you what I think is the same. He really, his, his focus was on helping the masses. Uh, as we know, Vanguard has some seven trillion plus dollars under management. A lot of that is for very, very large institutions. But the big institutions didn't seem to be on his mind. His mind was on the the smaller investor. And what he wanted out of the recommendations that he was making was that people would have enough. And I believe that what he was professing to be the best path, the glide path that the target date funds have are based on taking a moderate amount of risk and uh, conservatively changing that balance of fixed income and equity so that if you do that over a lifetime, and we've looked at this carefully, you have a legitimate shot uh, over the, let's say, from age 20 to 65, an 8% compound rate of return. Now, that is a very fine rate of return. And by the way, you're going to make more money in the early years. You're going to make less money in the latter years. And probably if you do that for 40 or 45 years, you'll be okay letting them go on and do it for the rest of your life because they'll do it for the rest of your life. In other words, you need to make one decision. That's it. I mean, that's pretty amazing to think. Most people over their lifetime, they change their portfolios three, four, five, maybe even 10 times before they finally find something they feel like is a long-term strategy. Well, the basic difference, and, and, and by the way, John was very critical of my work, not because I believe in having 10 different asset classes. He, he agreed with all that Fama and French research. There was nothing wrong with that. His point was it was too complex and that people, people are, are not going to follow a strategy if it's too complex, which is why we developed the two funds for life strategy. But where John Bogle and I differ is I'm not trying to build enough. I am trying to help people build more than enough. And I want to give you an example. Most people don't have enough. That's Let's start there. Most people do not retire with enough. There are a lot of people that all they have is Social Security to live on. And if that's enough, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling badly for them because... That's a tough. That's a tough way to spend thirty or forty years after mm -hmm. retirement. But what I do believe is, if we can save enough, plus, see, John would like them to get. I mean, from the conversation, this is what I'm gathering. You get to retirement, and you're able to take out four percent a year and adjust it upwards each year for inflation, and that you'll have enough. To last the rest of your life, you may not have much left over. In fact, you could be, you know, broke at the end of a long life, but but it should give you enough. There's a whole other level of how much you could have at retirement. It could be 125%, it could be 150%, it could be 200% of what you need, what you need. I kept working for money longer than I needed to, but part of what I wanted, I, I wanted to have way more than enough so that it wouldn't be a 4% extraction rate, it'd be a 5% extraction rate. And instead of having to adjust to the distribution based on inflation, don't even worry about inflation. We're already taking out more money than we need anyway. So if instead of a million taking out 40, 
if you've got a million and a half, you can take out 5%. You can take out 75, even though you only need 40. Yeah. And I want to help people get to the million and a half. And by the way, a whole lot more than a million and a half, because by the time that people get to retirement 30, 40 years from now, I'm just sure, based on the past, that inflation is going to cause you to want to have not a million or a million and a half, but five to seven million. I'm not kidding. Five to seven instead of a million. Mm. I have a great respect to uh, Jack John Bogle's uh, achievements, but also I think that he was quite lucky that he started his um, index funds in the middle of 70s when there was like 25 years or something, there was a like 17% annual compounded return yeah. on S&P 500. If he would start, let's say, in 2000, when there was a dot, a dot com crash, probably the whole story would uh, would would look different. Uh, would you agree with that? That um, totally. on top uh, of fact, the great work he did, he was also quite lucky. I brought that up when we met, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I, and I was serious because I've had many, many uh, things happen that that uh, we we have to grab uh, the luck that we that we have a chance to take advantage of and do what we can with it. He understood that totally. He also understood how close he came to not having anything in terms of uh, the greatness that he achieved because he had started uh, the, the, the 500 fund after having been terminated by, <laughs> by a company. And he was looking for a way to, to, to make his mark. He was not the first person to to come up with the idea of, uh, of an index fund. As a matter of fact, uh, Malkiel in his uh, original first edition of his random walk down Wall Street in 1973 discussed exactly what the uh, S&P 500 fund ended up being. I mean, it was a, just word for word what it ended up being. And on top of that, they come out with the S&P 500 fund in 1976 they expect to raise 150 million. They raise 11 million dollars. It was not. There was very little interest, and as far as I know, it may have been John Bogle and most of his friends who took that position at that point. And he had to argue with the trustees to allow it to continue to operate to give him a chance. What if they hadn't given him a chance? I mean, it's it's uh, and, and that kind of luck. It happens all of our lives. And it's one of the things when I teach college kids, I'd like to talk about the randomness. And there they are thinking they know what their future is going to be. They don't have any idea. I never thought I was going to end up owning a company that distributed jewelry making equipment and supplies. I mean, where did that come from? I didn't know I was going to end up running a company that manufactured high-speed paper handling equipment. How did that happen? I thought I was going to be a stockbroker. And I found out soon after having, for two years, I went in and applied for that job before I even graduated from, high, from college. Because I was hoping I'd go to work for the firm when I got out of college. No way. We don't want you. We don't want any kids. Go out and sell fuller brushes and come back and see us when you're 25 or 27. And then when I went in the last time, they actually agreed to hire me just when I was retiring. But you know something? I, I might have had to go out and sell fuller brushes for a while <laughs> before they would hire me. Um, the role of the market is the valuation of assets. So what's your opinion if everyone or most of us would start invest passively? I mean, there would be only buy and holders. Do you think that the market would not perform or would perform poorly in terms of uh, valuating uh, the assets? Or the market maybe would, would, would just stop working as expected because everyone would just only you know, buy the whole index and do nothing? Well, th th there's a lot of th theory around this because it, it, it is a, a consideration and, and more and more, I think, today 
that over 50% of the money in 401ks are going into target date funds where most of that money, whether it's at BlackRock or Vanguard or Fidelity, is likely in index funds. So that is, is certainly happening. But we have to remember uh, that it is a few, relatively few shares every day that dictate the, the price at the end of the day. And, and so it is my belief that there will always be the folks who are going to be moving around, uh, whether it's not necessarily day trading, but, but, but making those kinds of decisions when to be in or, or when to be out. So those, that's, how, that's how our investments are evaluated. What is a little confusing is if if enough money was going into uh, index funds that regardless of what's going on in the economy, that the market would keep going up and up and up. And and, and so that is, is confusing. But my sense is, and in fact, uh, uh, John Bogle talked about this a little bit. He said that they had a real problem uh, at, at Vanguard uh, during the late 90s, people were, were, were putting all their money or a lot of their money into growth. And when growth started fulfilling uh, their dreams, they sold and they went to value. By the way, they went to from the growth when the growth had declined a lot to the value after the value had gone up a lot. And so uh, I, I don't know that we will ever change that aspect of, uh, of, of investors and how they feel about losing money. We know that people don't like to lose money, but we also know the power of FOMO, fear of missing out. We also know the power of you only live once and people wanting to spend money rather than save it. These emotional drives are, are, are huge. And of course, what I'm trying to help is one individual make good decisions. I want to follow the lead of Warren Buffett. I want to make sure you do the right things. There's only a few of them. And I want to make sure you don't do the wrong things. There are a million of them. And so I really want to focus on the right things. And then, and this is a big Buffett quote, don't say what's left over after spending. Spend what's left over after saving. If we can just get those two quotes down, we are on the way to helping young people build some really serious portfolios.